Okay, class, let's get started. So today we're going to cover chapters two and three. So we're going to look at the simple supply and demand model, and then we'll also look at what elasticity is. So the first thing we want to talk about is what a market is. So a market is a concept of a medium. There's an abstract concept uh, by which buyers and sellers voluntarily exchange a particular good or service. So in any market, we have two groups of people, buyers, they represent the demand, and we have sellers who represent the supply of a good. Their interactions will determine a price and level of output. Now, a market doesn't necessarily have to be a physical place, it could be a virtual place. So obviously a physical market would be something like a farmer's market, but certainly there are many virtual markets. You have you know, Kijiji, eBay, the Toronto Stock Exchange, the foreign exchange market. There's a lot of markets that are virtual and that's fine. So a market is just uh, you know, some sort of medium where buyers and sellers interact. Now their interaction uh, determines a price and quantity in the market and that's what we'll look at. So we're going to look at the demand side and then we'll look at the supply side and then we put them together and we see that would determine a price and quantity in the market. So the first component of the market is the demand curve. So that's what we're gonna focus on now. Now, a demand curve is just showing the relationship between the product's price and the quantity demanded. And demand can be shown in a table. If it's in a table, if the data is in a table, then we call that a schedule. If we plot that data, we call it a, a curve. We will typically st stick with linear demand curves, but they don't necessarily have to be linear. The law of demand states that the price and quantity demanded are inversely related. So we're just gonna take that as given. Uh, so that means that if the price goes up, we would wanna buy less of it as consumers. And the market demand, so you can have an individual's demand curve, like for, you could think of yourself. If I were to ask you, um, you know, how much, how many Big Macs would you buy at lunch from McDonald's if the price were $1, you would give me an answer. If I said, well, what if the price was $1.50, you would give me an answer and I could go up to say maybe $10. And, I, and if I plotted those quantity demanded at those different prices, that would be your individual demand curve. And if we did that for the entire class and I added it up, added up across all of those prices. So for example, at $1, I add up how many of the students would wanna buy a Big Mac or how many how many Big Macs all of the students would want to buy that would be one point on the market or, or in this case it would be the the market would be the class that would be one point on the market demand curve and then I could just do that for every price and then I would plot the demand curve for the class so a market demand curve is just a sum of all of the individual consumers so let's look at a numerical and graphical example so again, the quantity demanded of a good is the quantities that consumers are willing and able to buy at a given point in time at various prices. So we're looking at the price and quantity demanded space. Price is on the vertical axis, quantity demanded is on the horizontal axis. Now we have some data here. So we're talking here about the market for strawberries. So we're just looking at the demand for strawberries. So we're not looking at the supply side yet. We're just looking at the demand side. And we're told that if the price of strawberries is $2.50 a kilogram, sorry, $2.50 a kilogram, then we would have that the quantity demanded would be seven. And so we plot this point, that's this point here, so if the price is 250, seven people would wanna buy it or the quantity demanded would equal seven kilograms per month. Now, if the price goes down to $2, then people would wanna buy it. So we have nine would wanna buy it now. And so that would be our second point, that would be point B. And if the price goes down to $1.50, people would wanna buy it. And so that would be point C. So again, the demand curve is just plotting combinations of prices and quantity demanded of a good. Okay, and we, because of the law of demand, we're just gonna state that now. Um, we won't exactly go and improve that, not in this course anyways, but it, you know, it makes intuitive sense that the lower the price, the more people would wanna buy, right? 
And so here would be our demand curve. So the, again, this is called the demand schedule. This would be the demand curve. Okay, so in this case, our demand curve looks like this, and it's based on this data here. And again, it's showing basically the consumer behavior. So we're just looking at consumers in isolation here, and then just making a picture of their behavior in terms of how much they would buy at different prices. And it's sort of a what if concept. It's what if the price is this, how much would they buy? We're not saying they actually are buying this. This is a, an abstract concept. We're saying if the prices were these, you know, if the prices varied as indicated here, this is how much the quantity demanded would be. We're not saying that the consumers actually will buy A, B, or C. We're, we're just looking at the relationship between the prices and the quantity demand. Okay, so the as the price increases, the quantity demanded falls, right? Where do buyers, or we, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why we think this, is, this inverse relationship is true. Um, why do buyers purchase less at higher prices? Well, of course, some are unwilling to pay the higher price, and others will actually be unable to pay the higher price, right? Um, and we can think of opportunity cost here. So the price of something increases, you got to spend more of your money on it. So you have to give up more of something else, right? So you may not want to do that, but some people just may not be able to pay the higher price. And what can buyers do instead of buying the product? Well, they could either substitute or do without. If you face a, a particular increase in prices, you can make a decision. Uh, do you want to do without, or do you want to substitute and buy something else? And you can also buy the good itself, but if you don't want to buy it, options are to substitute for something else or do without. Now, these two terms will be important when we think about elasticity in the next chapter. Um, if a particular good is such that there's lots of substitutes, or it's something that people can easily do without, then we would say that the good is very elastic. So buyers would be very sensitive to price changes because they have lots of other options and it's not something they, they really need. So let's derive a market demand curve. So here we have top and up here, we have your demand curve for strawberries, okay? And below here we have the data. So here are the different prices um, for you. So think of yourself. Let's suppose that at these prices, this is how many kilograms of strawberries you would demand. The price is 250, you'd only want one. If it's two, you'd want two. If it's 150, you'd want three. And so this would be your demand curve. I'll suppose your friend has this information in regards to the quantity demanded at these prices. So your friend would want to buy two at 250, three at two, and four at 150. And so your friend's demand curve for strawberries would look like this. Now, how do we get the market demand for strawberries, assuming that just you and your friend are the whole market? Well, we look at each price and we sum what the total amount of the quantity demanded is. So at 250, the total quantity demanded is one plus two equals three. At $2, it's two plus three equals five. And at 150, it's three plus four equals seven. And so if we plot that, we get the market demand curve as indicated here. Does that make sense? Is there any questions on that? You can type it in the chat function if you like. Okay, so th there was no questions. Oh, can you uh, re-explain the chart, please? Um, so here we have three different charts, right? One is your demand curve for strawberries, and that's based on this first column of data here. The second chart is for your friend, okay? And their data is here. And the market cur demand curve for strawberries, which is both you and your friend, we're assuming that only you and your friend make up the market, is indicated here. Okay, so this demand curve just shows how you would react in terms of how much you would buy to these different prices. This is how much your friend would react. And if we add, it to add them together, we get the market demand curve for strawberries. So for example, at 250, uh, that you would buy one, your friend would buy two, and so the total is three. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, there is, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm gonna point that out in a sec, but why not do it now? There is a, uh, a in terms of terminology, when we say quantity demanded, we're talking about a movement along the curve. And when we say that, uh, you know, say for example, we say there's a change in demand without using the word quantity, that indicates a shift in the curve. But we'll we'll get to that in a moment. It's just fill. It's just making it a little more clear the total amount of quantity demanded. So here. Um, at two dollars, 
this is the total, you know, the quantity demanded would just be two if we're looking at you. Okay, so if we were looking at the expenditures, we would take price times the quantity and that would give us this area here. Your friend likes strawberries a bit more at $2, they would purchase three. So this is how much they would spend. And then when we combine them, we get that this is how much both of you would spend. You'd both be buying five at $2. And so this would be the total expenditures on strawberries. Okay, so again, to get the total expenditures, you would just take the price times the quantity. Okay, because you know we're saying here uh, the quantity demanded would be five. So if five people buy it at two dollars, then this area here would equal the total expense. Um, so let's look at some of the questions here. So, um, so yeah, the area, yeah, the area here rep you could think of it as representing the consumer's expenditure on the good, or you could also think of it as how much the firm would receive in revenue as well, right? Because the consumer is going to be spending that and that's and the firm's going to be taking it, right? So the, you know, for any particular point, if we multiply the price times the quantity, we will get the total revenue for the firm uh, or analogously the total expenditures that consumer. Does that make sense? Yeah, and we're, and we're just using two as you know, as a comparison, we could do a similar thing for any of the prices. Okay, so let's talk now about changes in demand. So now we're gonna talk about shifting the curve. So in our diagram, we just had the price of the good and the quantity demanded. Now, the quantity demanded of a good can depend on more than just the price of the good, right? It could depend on other things. But on our market diagram, we just have the price on there and the quantity demanded on the horizontal axis and the price on the vertical axis. So if any of these other things change other than the price of the good, we would represent that with a shift in the curve. Okay, so when we draw a demand curve, we're holding constant any other factors, like for example, income. And we're drawing that curve and just showing the particular relationship between the prices and the quantity demand. And again, we depict changes in these other factors with a shift in the demand curve. So let's look at an example. So here is a demand curve for strawberries. This is what we had before. Okay, now suppose that something happens that at every price people would want to buy more. In this example, they'd want to buy two more. So if the price is 250, uh, the consumers would want to buy nine instead of seven, 11 instead of nine, uh, 13 instead of 11. So anything could happen, you know, if incomes increased or if the prices of other uh, berries went up by a lot, people might just want to buy strawberries now. Okay, so there, we'll, we'll talk about some of the factors in a moment, but a shift to the right in the demand curve means that at any price, the quantity demanded has increased. Okay, so this could happen because changes other than the price of the good uh, happened and resulted in people wanting more at every price. So again, we have price here and quantity demanded. Quantity demanded, one of the most important determinants is the price of the good. But there are other determinants. When those other determinants change, we shift the curve. To the left in the demand curve would just be the opposite. Something like incomes fell or or maybe there's just an over, maybe there's a study out saying that strawberries are bad for your health. Then we would represent that with a shift to the left in the demand curve. So you can see here at every price now, the quantity demanded has fallen. So it went down by two from seven, it fell by two from nine, it fell by two from 11, okay? So someone has a question, um, is the, in this case, it will elastic. Um, don't worry about that for now. We're, we're gonna talk about elasticity in the next chapter. And then it mentioned in the reading, the independent variables plotted on the Y axis. Um, so typically when, you know, in general, when we're looking at relationships between variables, we put the uh, independent variable on the horizontal axis and then the dependent variable on the vertical axis. That's a good point because we're not really doing that here. Here we have the, basically the thing that can vary is the price and then the quantity demanded is sort of what depends is the dependent variable that's this is just the way we draw demand curves uh but that's a good point but you don't you know we don't necessarily have to always you know we have our choice what to do with what we want to put on either axis 
just by convention, when we draw demand curves, we put the price on the, the vertical axis and the quantity demanded on the horizontal axis. And so we we will get into the details yet, but typically in a, we think of a competitive market and so the price of a good is given. So we are sort of taking this as an independent variable and this is the dependent variable, but don't get too caught up into that, but that's a good point. So, but you know, we draw the demand curves in this space, price on the vertical axis and the quantity demanded on. So what are some of these other factors? So the number of buyers in a market of course, uh, would, you know, if there is an increase in the number of people or a number of consumers in a market, we would represent that with a shift to the right in the demand curve. Income is an important determinant of the quantity demanded of a good. We represent that with shifts in the demand curve. Uh, so if income increased, we would shift the demand curve to the right. If it decreased, we would shift it to the left. Uh, for normal products, an increase in income causes demand to shift to the right. So let's be a little more specific here. Normally, we would represent an increase in income as a shift to the right in the demand curve. Uh, that's because most products are what's called normal products. And if we have more income, we'd want to buy more of them. But there are goods that are inferior. So for example, think of uh, maybe some of the food you're buying right now because you're a student. I know when I was a student, uh, especially in undergrad, and then and you're young and doesn't really matter that much uh, how badly you eat. So I would buy, you know, craft dinner and, and cheap chicken wieners at the grocery store. But as soon as I graduated and got a real job and made some decent money, those things I wouldn't buy anymore. So there's some goods where if your income increases, you would buy less of them. And those are inferior goods. And so that would, in that case, we would represent it uh, with a shift to the left. There's other factors. Price of related goods is important. Now, let's think about it. Uh, for example, we were thinking of at the mall and there's two restaurants that sell pizza. There might be some slight differences. One might be a deep dish pizza. The other might be a traditional pizza. Now, if we think of the demand curve for the traditional pizza, if the other rest restaurant selling the deep dish pizza increased their price a lot, say they increased their price by 50%, what would happen to the demand for the traditional? It would increase. So the price, and in that case, those goods are substitutes because the they're very similar and the consumer can substitute one for the other. And so since they're related in that way, the demand curve can shift because of a price change in the other good. Not the price of the good itself, but the price of the other good. Substitute products, including imports, a uh, rise in the other product's price causes demand to shift to the right. Now, there are other types of related goods. The other type is called complementary goods. And it, so let's think of what a complementary good is. The best example I can come up with is uh, hot dogs and hot dog buns. So you buy those in pairs, right? So if the price of, so let's say, for example, there's a shortage of flour and the price of hot dog buns triples. What do you think would happen to the demand for hot dog? Anyone want to type that in the chat? So good. It would decrease, right? So that's the opposite of if they were substitute goods. In the substitute case, we had that it would increase, but now we're having that it would decrease. And so again, if we have uh if we're looking at a particular good in a market and how you know and it's a complementary good then the price of that other good that complement good will changes in the price of that other uh, good will affect the demand for the uh, initial okay so again if you're thinking of the hot dogs and hot dog bun example changes in the prices of hot dog buns will affect the demand for hot dogs and vice versa okay so consumer preferences consumer expectations these also can play i mean people just you know we're human beings sometimes we just without knowing sometimes we just have different changes in our preferences or there's fads you know if there's a increase uh towards healthier eating that would increase the demand for certain healthy goods and expectations are also important if we all ex so what do you think would happen to the demand curve for gasoline tonight we all expected that the price of gasoline tomorrow would increase by a lot it would increase tonight because everyone would want to buy a lot tonight because they believe that the price would be increasing tomorrow um so someone asked uh 
Can you explain this again? What uh, precisely did you want me to explain again? So, um, and then oh, complementary goods. So complementary goods are goods that are bought together, like a baseball glove and a baseball or hot dogs and hot dog buns. So if the price of one of them changes, it will affect the demand for the other. And it will do it in a way uh, that's different than when if the goods were substitutes. So for example, if the price of hot dog buns increases a lot, that would cause the demand for hot dogs to fall because you have to buy them in pair. Okay. And uh, so what about social issues like the current pandemic? Well, the, in economics, we don't focus on social issues. We focus just on the economics. Um, I, you know, the, the pandemic would currently, you know, there's lots to talk about that in terms of economics, but for what we're doing right now, uh, I guess, you know, since a lot of people's incomes are falling and well, actually the best example would be the uh, oil market. So we know that a lot of people aren't driving right now. So there's obviously going to be a huge shift to the left in the, or there was a huge shift in the left to the left in the demand curve for oil. And so that explains why its price would fall by such a large amount. So changes in quantity demanded. So again, if we're talking about changes in the quantity demanded, we're talking about a movement along the demand curve, okay? Uh, and these are caused by price changes. So, I mean, if you just think of what the demand curve is, the demand curve shows the relationship between the price of the good and the quantity demanded. So if we are moving along the demand curve, we're looking at the different price and quantity combinations. So when we're talking about that, say that uh, if we're referring to the quantity demanded increasing price change, we, we just always use the word quantity demanded. So if I say that the quantity demanded increased, then I must be talking about a movement along the curve. But if I say um, there was a change in demand, or an increase in demand using the word quantity, then I'm saying that the demand curve uh, shifted, okay? It's just a simple terminology. It's just to make sure we know what each other's talking about, okay? So demand is used when talking about shifting a curve, and the quantity demanded is used when we're talking about a movement along the curve. So for example, we have a demand curve here, higher prices, quantity demand is going to fall. So if the price goes from P0 to P1, quantity will go from QA0 to QA1. And that's, you know, we're talking about a movement along the curve. The quantity demanded fell because the price increased. But changes in other determinants of demand other than the price, so what's not on the diagram, like income and price of related goods, that would shift the demand curve. For example, if the incomes of these consumers increased and this is a normal good, then we would represent that with a shift to the right in the demand curve. So again, here we have a demand curve. We're going to start at point A. So a change in the quantity demanded is showed, shown on the left as a movement along a single demand curve from a change in the product's own price. Here we have that the price fell from $2 to 150, and so the quantity demanded increased from 5,000 to 6,000. On the right shows a shift in the demand curve, and this is saying that at any price, the quantity demanded has increased. And this could happen because of things other than the price of the good, such as income, price of related goods, expectations, or anything like that. So someone has a question, can we associate an increase in demand for a certain something as something positive or not necessarily? Uh, well, if there's an increase in the demand for uh, alcohol or cigarettes, that's probably not a good thing. Depends on how you look at it. For the company selling them, it would be a good thing, but not for, for every, you know, maybe not for society. So it depends on the context of what you're looking at. Okay, so let's do some practice. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll practice some of these ideas here. So what we're going to do is think about how each of these situations listed here would affect the demand curve for state, okay? So if there are increases in family income, how would we represent that? Would we shift, how would we shift the demand curve for state? You can type it in the chat. Yep, that's right. So it would shift it to the right. What about a decrease in the prices of pork and chicken? That's right. That's correct. It would shift it to the left. And that's because pork and chicken are substitutes for steak, right? So if um, pork and chicken are cheaper now, people may substitute away from steak and buy that. 
And so we don't put the price of pork and chicken on the diagram, right? So we're going to represent changes in prices of related goods with a shift in the curve. And in this case, it would shift to the left. What about a trend among consumers toward white meat and fish? So correct, it would be shifting it to the left. So there's a question here. Is there a possibility that the demand increases first and the price of the product is affected later? Um, we could we'll we'll look at we'll talk about that a little bit later because we haven't yet determined what the price would be we're just looking at the demand curve we're just looking at the relationship we don't know what the price in the market is going to be because we need the supply curve to be able to determine that okay so right now there is no uh you know there is no set pr that we're just looking at the relationship between the quantity demanded and the prices so what if there's an expectation that a railway strike will interrupt shipments of beef from Western Canada? How would that affect? So think of the demand curve now for steak. It would increase it. That's right. Now, the last one, what if there's an increase in the price of steak? Well, someone got it good. Uh, this was a bit of a trick question. So there is going to be no shift because if we're talking about an increase in the price of steak, we're talking about moving along the demand curve steak. So there's no shifting of the curve. Okay. So here's another question. It says, draw a demand curve for music downloads. What happens to it in each of the following scenarios? So suppose the price of iPods falls. So in this case, we're thinking of music downloads. So you, you know, your, I guess we're assuming here that the iPods would be, is what you, what is used to play these downloads. So if more people have iPods because they're cheaper, they buy more of them then that would increase the demand for music downloads. So that would be a shift to the right in the demand curve for downloaded music. The price of music downloads falls. So that's just a movement along the curve, right? So if it falls, then the quantity demanded would increase. C says the price of CDs falls. So if that's the case, this is sort of a substitute. So if the price of CDs falls, then we're saying maybe people would uh, be less interested in downloading music. And so that would be a shift to the left in the demand. Okay, it's a bit of a dated example, but um, the idea here is sim simply, in general, we're just saying what happens if the price of a substitute good falls? Well, that would shift the demand curve to the other good to the left. Okay, now we're switching over to the firm. So we're gonna look at the supply curve. So we're going to use our, the same price and quantity space, but now we're looking at the quantity supplied of a good at different prices. So it's the relationship between a product's price and quantity supply. So again, just like in demand, we could have, if we have the data in a table, we call it a schedule. If we plot it, it's a curve. Supply relates to the amount a firm wants to offer for sale on a market given different market prices. So it's still a what if concept. We're saying, what if the price is this? How much would the firms want to offer for sale? What if the price is this? What do they want to offer for sale, et cetera? And the law of supply states that there's a direct relationship between the price and quantity supply. Simply put, if the price is higher, they could make more profit per unit and we'd be holding constant, say, input prices or anything like that. And so if you can get more profit per unit, firms would want to offer more for sale. That's the main idea. Okay, so let's look at a numerical and graphical example. So here in the table, we have various prices and for each price, we have the quantity supplied. So that's how much the firms would be willing to offer for sale. And so the first point would be plotted here. Now, if the price goes down to $2, well, not as many firms would want to offer that for sale. Maybe this is not the price isn't. So maybe some firms, their cost structure is a little higher. They're not as efficient maybe. And so they wouldn't be able to make profit at $2. So some of them don't bother to, wouldn't want to offer anything for sale. And so this next uh, point would be here at E. And if the price goes down further, the quantity supplied falls again, and that would be price D or uh, point D. Okay, and so our supply curve would be uh, drawn by connecting the points here. And notice how it's a positive relationship. So this works differently than how the consumers behaved. Here, firms behave in such a way that if prices increase, they want to offer more for sale, okay? Similar to the demand curve, there are other things than the price of the good that affect how much a seller would want to offer for sale, okay? So uh, again, in our diagram, we just have the price of the good and the 
quantities and we're holding any of these other factors constant. And so changes in them will be represented with a shift in the supply. So again, I'll go through this quickly because it's similar to the demand curve. So if supply were to uh, shift to the right, that means that at every price, the quantity supplied would be higher. In this case, it's higher by two units. So one example could be input prices. So maybe it's cheaper to produce, so they can make more profit per unit, so they'd want to offer more for sale. A shift to the left would be located like this, where at each price, now there's less quantity supply, less offered for sale on the market. What are some of the factors that shift the supply curve? Well, of course, you know, the number of people in the market will affect how we draw the supply curve. If all of a sudden there's an increase in the number of suppliers or number of firms, then we'd represent that with a shift to the right. Now, you could also think about maybe opening up a certain market to foreign competition. Then all of a sudden there'd be more firms in the market. And so we would represent with that with a shift to the right. So the prices of inputs are a key thing. They will result in the supply curve shifting. If And so resource prices are just the input prices. So a good example would be wages. Wages are usually used in all businesses. So they're a cost of production. If they were to fall, it would be cheaper per unit. And so you know for any given price, they would want to produce more. It would shift to the right. If they fall, or sorry, if they increase, if wages were to increase, then it would shift to the left. So let's look at some questions here. So price goes up, supply goes up and demand goes down so how do how the common price is decided for buyer and seller so again we will so we're not done yet we're looking at the demand first then we're going to look we're looking at supply so we're looking at the two components individually then we're going to put them together and talk about uh, how we get the equilibrium price equality so we'll do that in a moment again the number of producers it, you know we're just saying here the more producers in a market the greater the supply curve would be shifting to the, the right. So if we had a domestic market that was protected with tariffs from foreign competition, and all of a sudden the government opened up, uh, you know, removed the tariffs so that there's foreign competition, well, we would represent that with a shift to the right in the supply curve, because now there'd be more producers in the market. So technology is important because technology can uh, end up turning out to increase productivity, which reduces cost. And so increased efficiency uh, would be represented with a rightward shift in the supply curve. Um, the price of substitute products. So um, an increase causes the supply to shift to the left. So a, a good way to think about this is suppose you're a firm and you're selling two different goods and you use sort of similar resources to do that. If the price of one of the goods goes up a lot, so the mar for whatever reason in the market, the uh, price now you can get is much higher, you may substitute away from you know, your, your limited, you might use some of your limited resources to produce more of the good in which you could get a higher price. So that would cause the supply curve of the other good to shift to the left. Changes in nature. So of course, uh, if you were thinking of the supply of corn or some agricultural product, then, you know, a bug infestation or, you know, anything like, a, you know, a tornado, any type of disaster or certain changes in weather could affect the supply, right? So if there's an improvement in weather or something positive, then that would shift the supply curve to the right. Um, so in terms of this price of substitutes product, so someone's asking me to explain it again. So here we're talking about firm just consider the example of a firm that sells two goods and they use similar resources to make them. Well, if the price of one of the goods all of a sudden increases a lot, they're gonna wanna maybe make more of that and make less of the other good because they can get a higher price for that other good. So that's the idea there. And then of course, producer expectations can play a role just like expectations played a role for the consumer. If a firm expects lower prices in the future, then they might want to offer more for sale now. So that would be 
a shift to the right in the supply curve now. Um, you could think of if you had a little eBay business, uh, maybe, you know, maybe think that you're making toys for pets or something like that. And it's maybe October. You expect that you could probably get a higher price in a couple months during the holiday season. So you might want to not offer as much for sale. So your supply would be less right now, but it would increase when you expect that the market will be better and you can get a better price. Okay, so changes in quantity supplied. So again, this is the same logic as before. If we're talking about the price of the good changing, we're moving along the curve and in about any of the factors that aren't on the diagram like the ones we just talked about on the last slide then we're referring to a shift in the supply curve so if i say there's an increase in supply i'm talking about the curve shifting if i say there's an increase in quantity supplied i'm referring to a movement along the curve okay so here again we have an example of a supply curve. If the price were to increase from 100 to 200, then the quantity supplied would increase. That's a movement along the curve. Here, we're drawing a new supply curve to the right of the old one. So we're saying at any price, the quantity supplied increase. And then we would just say in that case that we have an increase in supply. Um, so just a quick question. We have a particular city and there are 12,173 three bedroom homes. Is this a supply of three bedroom homes in, in the city? I don't have a, an answer to that. No, you're, you're correct. This isn't the supply. The physical amount that's in existence isn't the supply. The supply refers to how much is actually being offered for sale. So it's only the people who are offering to have their home for sale. So again, supply, just like demand, it's a what if concept. It's uh, not only of how many of it are being offered for sale at the current prices, but how many would be offered if the price were higher or lower than the current price. So again, it's, we vary prices and see how much people would want to uh, offer for sale. Okay, so let's do a similar exercise as before, but for the supply curve. Here we're thinking of the demand, uh, the supply curve for shoes, okay? And then we have some scenarios here. So the first one, would this uh, shift the supply curve to the right or the left? So we have an increase in imports of shoes from South America. That would be a shift to, okay? So we have an increase. Basically, you know, there's more being offered for sale on the market. We're going to sh represent that with a shift to the right in the supply curve. What if there's improvements in the efficiency of shoe manufacture? It would be a shift to the right. Um, so it looks like there's one question here. So uh, if the price of the substitute product were to increase, wouldn't the people be inclined to work? So again, we're you're talking about 10 different things. We're just looking at a supply curve. So we're we're just talking about the firm. We're talking about the firm having, you know, it it sells two different goods. If the price of one of the goods is higher all of a sudden, they may want to redirect some of their resources into producing the good where they can get a higher price. So the supply of the other good would fall. So that's all we're saying with the price of substitute goods in terms of the supply side. Uh, the demand side, when we talk about price of related goods, that's a totally different story. Okay, whoops. So suppose there's an increase in the cost of shoe leather. How would we represent that? Yep, that's correct. That would be a shift to the left. What about expectations that prices will be higher in a month? Yes, that's correct. And what about a change in the price of shoes? Okay, good. You didn't fall for it that time. So yeah, we're talking about the supply curve for shoes. So the price of shoes, if that changes, we're talking about moving along the supply curve. No. Okay, so this is part one. We'll move on to part two. Um, don't forget to do the end of chapter problems. Let me just open up the second part here, and we're going to be putting together the supply and the demand curve. So we're going to be putting them together. Now, let's talk about the concept of an equilibrium. So an equilibrium is a situation, well, in general, it's a situation where there's no tendency for some kind of a system to move. So any system, if it's an equilibrium, then it's, it's in a point of no change. So a market equilibrium is a situation in which the price has reached the level where the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded. And if that's such, then the price will have no tendency to change. And we'll mention why that's the case now. Um, so just go to the 
diagram here. Um, this is just a special case. So in some cases, if the supply and demand curve don't touch each other, then you can't have an equilibrium. That's not, uh, you know, a, a common thing. So I'm just going to go to the diagram because it's so much easier to explain with the diagram. So we have a supply and demand curve put together. Okay. We have demand. We have supply. So we're saying we're going to claim that two dollars where they intersect is the equilibrium price, and nine is the equilibrium quantity. Why is that the case? Well, the best way to think about it is to think about what if the price was not at the equilibrium. If the price was above the equilibrium. What situation would we have? If the price was $3, for example, how much would people want to buy? Someone type that in the chat. They would want to buy four, uh, five units, I think. Yeah, roughly five here. And how much would firms want to offer for sale? Well, a much larger number over here. So actually, the numbers are right here. So at $3, the quantity demanded would be five and the quantity supplied would be 13 we would have a surplus. What, what are firms going to do in this situation? So basically what's happened here is firms made too much stuff. Not everyone wants to buy it at that price. So let's suppose the price is 250 and we have our surplus here in the amount of four. What's going to happen? Anyone? So what, what do you, would the price stay at 250? Would the firm still keep trying to sell at 250? Yeah, no, the price would fall. So bottom line, if the price is above the equilibrium, cause a surplus and there'll be a tendency for the price to fall. OK, so any price above the equilibrium isn't stable and it'll tend to want to fall back down towards here. Uh, but is it going to keep keep going down? No, it's going to stop here because if we look at any price below the equilibrium, whoops, any price below the equilibrium, we are going to get a shortage. Um, I'm just going to check something here. I don't know why. So if we have a price below the equilibrium, we end up with a shortage. So for example, uh, at 150 at this very low price consumers would want to buy a lot they would want to buy 11 but producers won't want to supply as much and they would only want to supply seven so we would have a shortage if there's a shortage of a good what would the tendency be in terms of the direction of the price it would tend to rise so if we have prices above the equilibrium we have a surplus we would expect that the price to fall we have if we have prices below the equilibrium we would expect a shortage and the price would increase so in a market if it's unimpeded and we just have voluntary exchange no government intervention we would expect that the price would tend to go you know to lean towards two dollars and it would be such that the quantity supplied equal the quantity demanded so just think of any market we're just saying it would tend to go to a a situation where amount that people want to buy would be equal to the amount that the firms would want to offer for sale. Okay, that's all we're saying. So that would be the equilibrium price and quantity. It's always going to, you know, we're saying there's a tendency to go towards the intersection of these two points. So let's do a practice question. So we have a demand curve and a supply curve. And it's saying uh, if the government forced the price of this product uh, at a level above the equilibrium price, say at a price of $5, what would the result be? Correct answer here. We would end up with a surplus 60 units. So the answer is C. What if the government made the price be $2? What would we get? Yeah, that's, that's correct. We would get a shortage of 40 units. So at a price of $2, this would be the quantity supplied. This would be the quantity demanded. So what people want to buy is 70. What's offered for sale is 30. The difference is 40. And so we would have a shortage of 40. So the correct answer is part is B. So now what happens if we have a shift in the demand or supply curve? What happens to the equilibrium? So a rightward demand shift would push up both equilibrium price and quantity. A leftward shift would push down both equilibrium price and quantity. And a rightward supply shift will push equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity uh, down. Sorry, it would bring it up. So I'm going to leave this slide as a summary for you to read later, but it's more interesting to actually look at a diagram when doing this. If we have initial supply and demand curves indicated here, and then demand shifts to the right. Demand, the demand curve shifts to the right, and so we know that at this old equilibrium price, so the initial equilibrium price was $2, now the demand curve shifted to the right. So at this original price, we have a shortage. 
And so there'd be a tendency for the price to get bid up to here. This would be the new equilibrium point. So whenever we have an increase in demand, we would expect that the price would increase, the quantity demanded would increase, okay? If we have a increase in supply, so here we have an increase in supply. We're originally here, so $2 and roughly, yeah, $2 and nine, okay? So the quantity demanded and supplied is nine. Then we have an increase in supply. So a shift to the right in the supply curve. So at this initial price of $2, we would have a surplus. And so the price would tend to wanna to fall and go down here to the new equilibrium. So if supply shifts to the right, the demand curve doesn't change, then we would expect the price in the market to fall and more of it to be sold on the market, bought and sold on the market. That just makes intuitive sense. So you have demand staying the same, but all of a sudden there's more stuff on the market. For all of it to get sold, we would need the price to fall and be lower. And so we would expect the price to fall and the quantity supply to increase. Okay, so let's do another practice question. So we have a bunch of situations here and we're gonna indicate the market. Uh, we're gonna indicate which curve shifts and in which direction and what the resulting change in the market equilibrium price and quantity would be. So see if you could do the first question. So here we have that the price of flour has substantially increased and as a result, many pizzerias have shut down. So I'll, I'll give you a sec to think about that. So what is the market? Well, it's just pizza, right? What curve is gonna shift here? Anyone? It's the supply curve. So there's nothing in this part of the, the nothing in this scenario that mentions anything about the things that shift the demand. Clearly, we have now we're told that there's less businesses offering pizza for sale, so we would represent that with a shift to the left in the supply. Also, the price of an input has increased, which would also result in the supply curve shifting. To Okay, so that would be what curve is going to shift and in which direction? Well, it's going to shift to the left. And so what's going to happen to the equilibrium price and quantity? So it's helpful to maybe sketch these out. We have supply of demand. What happened? Well, the supply curve shifted to the left, right? So what's going to happen to the equilibrium quantity? The equilibrium quantity is going to fall. We're comparing this to this. And then the equilibrium price is going to increase, right? Okay, so that is what will happen. So this will increase and the quantity will fall. Let's see if you can uh, do the second one. So just type in the chat, you know, the market, the curve, the direction, and the new equilibrium. Uh, okay, yes, that's correct. So here we're saying that the manufacturers of hot dog buns are happy because the makers of hot dogs have cut their prices in half. So obviously here the market is hot dog buns. Okay, what curve is it? It's the demand curve and which direction is it going to shift so hot dog people who make hot dogs have cut their price in half so a lot of people would want to buy hot dogs now so that would cause the market you know the demand for hot dog buns to also increase so it would shift to the right okay and if we have a demand curve shifting to the right what happens to the equilibrium price and quantity both increase so we're comparing this point to this point so we're initially here then we go up to here, right? Price is gonna increase. We look at the quantity. What's gonna to happen to the quantity? Well, we were initially here, now we're here. It's an increase in the quantity, okay? So both the price and the quantity will increase. The next question says, a new technique was discovered by soap manufacturers that substantially reduces the time and labor required to form and shape a bar of soap. So we're talking about the market for soap. So what are we talking about here? A demand curve shifting or a supply curve? So clearly, yes, supply. And we're saying there's been an improvement here in technology, so that's a shift to the right. And if the supply curve shifts to the right, the equilibrium price and quantity will move as follows. The price will fall and the quantity demanded will increase. So again, you can just draw a demand and supply curve and then shift the supply curve to the right and you'll see that the new equilibrium price will be lower and the quantity will be higher. Okay, and then, then the last one here, it says the owners of high-end restaurants uh, are worried about the recent loss of thousands of jobs, many of whom are highly paid executives in the city. Okay, so the market here is fine dining. What curve must be must we be talking about here? It's the demand curve. So basically we have that a lot of people's incomes have fallen because they lost their jobs. And so we would represent that with a shift to the left in the demand curve. 
And when demand shifts, you know, things move in the same direction. So if demand shifts to the right, price and quantity both increase. If demand shifts to the left, both price and quantity fall. Now, if we have a simultaneous rightward shift in demand and supply, um, that would end up, okay, so we, we'll look at these simultaneous shifts. Um, it, it's more useful to look at it in a diagram. So here we have our initial point A, we have the de initial demand curve, initial supply curve, and now we have that demand shifts to the right, also supply shifts to the right. Now, they're bo they both shift by the exact same amount. So what's the new equilibrium price and quantity? We were initially here, What's the new equilibrium? Well, it hasn't changed. The new equilibrium quantity has increased, right? Now, the reason why there's no change in price is because the demand and supply curve shifted by the exact same amount. When the demand curve shifted to the right, that would cause prices to increase, right? So if we didn't have the supply curve, we would be going up here. But a supply curve shifting to the right causes prices to go down. And since it shift by the exact same amount, the new point would be right here, okay? If we have the supply shift to the left and the demand shift to the left by the same amount, we will get that the quantity won't change, but the price will. And so if we think about what would happen to the quantity, we start at point A, an increase in demand would make the quantity want to increase, right? A shift to the left in the supply would make it want to fall. So they actually just completely offset each other because the demand and supply curve have shifted by the same amount. And so the quantity didn't change. But the effect on price of demand increasing and supply decreasing are both such that it would increase the price. So we have that the price would increase. Um, I just want to make sure we can finish on time. So I'll leave you to do this for homework. And so I just finish off here with a summary of all the different shifts that can happen. So this is good for you to review. So when you're studying, you should, you know, actually be writing these out on paper and, and uh, experimenting with different shifts and what would happen. So here we have, you know, if we have an increase in demand, we always have that the price and the quantity would increase. If we have uh, two curves shifting, we have, you know, it, it could be indeterminate depending on the relative shifts of either of the curves. So just review these. This is good, a good review to summarize all of the shifts. Okay, so again, make sure you read chapter two in the textbook and then additionally do problem six uh, to not. Okay, so I have to move on to elasticity now. Um, did you want maybe a, a, a two minute break? Let's just take a quick two minute break and then we'll we'll get into that. Okay. Okay, so let's continue. So now we're going to talk about elasticity. What is elasticity? Well, in a nutshell, it's the it's a measure of the responsiveness of buyers and sellers to changes in prices. So we know from the law of demand that consumers will respond to a fall in price by buying more, but we don't know how much more. We haven't talked about that yet. In terms of supply, we know that if prices increase, firms want to supply more, but we haven't said anything about how much more. So elasticity is about the degree of sensitivity uh, of consumers and firms to a change in price. So we're first going to talk about the price elasticity of demand. So this is related to how responsive consumers are to changes in price. So if demand is elastic, so we're saying that they're very sensitive, it means that the percentage change in the quantity demanded is more than the percentage change in the price. So if the change in the price was 10% increase and the quantity demanded fell by more than 10%, we would say that the demand is elastic. And if it were to if the price were to increase by 10%, but the quantity demanded fell by less than 10%, we would say it's inelastic. And then unit elastic is just the term where the percentage changes would be the same. Okay, so let's go into some of the details here. So let's just look at an overall demand curve. So this demand curve is very steep and let's consider a given price change. Okay, so for this given price change, we know that the quantity will change by this small amount here. Okay, so regardless of it's up or down, we know that the change in the quantity will be very small. Okay, so this would represent represent a good and, and consumers who don't really change their behavior that much for a given price change. This could be something like maybe cigarettes or tobacco. Now, if we draw a 
very steep or uh, a flat demand curve and for that exact same price change see here that the quantity demanded would change by a lot and so this would represent a consumer who can easily substitute or do without the good okay so this would be an elastic demand curve and the steep what we would call an inelastic demand so when we draw a steep demand curve we're saying that the buyers are not very sensitive to prices and if we draw a flat one, we're saying they are very sensitive to price. And the key thing here is whether uh, buyers can easily do without or easily sub terminology. So we say something's elastic if for a given price change, there's a sizable change in the quantity demanded. And we say it's inelastic if there is very little change in the quantity demanded. So the buyers aren't very sensitive to price changes. So um, gasoline would be something that's more inelastic because we drive to work. Not well, lately it's been a bit different, but you know, generally, um, the price of gasoline can change quite a bit and we're not really going to change that much our behavior in terms of driving because usually we need to get to work or, or you know we're not always we're not driving that much just for luxury right so uh, goods like gasoline would have inelastic demand uh, an example of an elast elastic demand would be maybe something like uh, for at the grocery store and there's green beans and yellow beans if the price of yellow beans goes up even by a little bit why would you buy more you know why would you buy them when you can buy the other beans they're both the same and you know the color doesn't really matter in terms of the taste so you know for small changes in price we could get a large change in the quantity demand so here we're talking about ice cream okay so in the left here we have an elastic demand curve for ice cream cones okay so here we have that if the price goes up by 20%, so that would be $2 to $2.40, the quantity demanded would fall by 50%. Okay, so that's, you know, elastic. So at these two points, the demand is elastic. If we had the demand curve, a demand curve that looked like this, for that exact same 20% price increase, if we had that the quantity demanded only fell by 10%, we would say that that any less. So we can think of some extreme cases. So if we draw a perfectly horizontal demand curve, that would mean there's a constant price and a horizontal demand curve. So that means that, you know, there's only one price. If the price deviates even a, a tiny fraction, then the quantity demanded will go to zero. Okay, so that's an extreme case. We will use this later in the course. There's a specific uh, example where this would come in handy. Perfectly inelastic would be just a you know a, a vertical demand curve. Uh, so that means it's basically whatever the price is, it doesn't matter. The quantity demanded is fixed. So maybe that's something like uh, insulin for. For example, if you're a diabetic, you need it, so you need it to survive. So the, whatever the price is, you you would have to buy. So that's you know examples of extreme cases. So if we had horizontal line here for the demand curve, we would say that the demand for in this example soybeans is perfectly elastic. Um, we could think about a particular firm producing in this market, and they can only take the market prices given. They can't charge any more. So we'll we'll, we'll talk about this we'll give a better example of this later in the course but we're just saying that you know only one price is relevant anything that deviates from this would result in there being zero quantity demand here's a vertical demand curve perfectly elastic inelastic sorry perfectly inelastic and an example would be something like in so let's see if we can do this practice question so let's rank the elasticity of demand for the following products from one to four with one for the most elastic and four for the most inelastic so it might help here to think about the concepts or the two terms i talked about earlier um doing without or easily substitute so if a product can be easily substituted or it can easily do without, then it's elastic, right? Well, all of these goods shown here are pretty much equal in terms of consumers maybe want ability to be able to do without. So let's just focus on the degree of substitutability here. So which one would be the most easy to substitute? So I want to type that in, anyone? What's the easiest one to substitute? So yeah, the, the last one would probably be the easiest because if we look at it, we're talking about Nelson's chocolate ice cream so there's a lot of different brands of chocolate ice cream and then you can also substitute the flavor okay so there's lots of substitutes to this available now 
if we were to look at chocolate ice cream, that would be sort of the next in terms of substitutability. So now we're just talking about chocolate ice cream in general. And so we can substitute that for other flavors. Um, then we can look at ice cream. Ice cream, you know, you could substitute that for other, say, frozen dairy products, but there's not too many of them. And then frozen dairy products would be, you know, there's barely any substitutes for that. So that would be the most or the least elastic on this list here. So the answer here would be uh, four, two, and three. Okay. Does that make sense? So what would be more elastic, new automobiles or replacement parts for automobiles? So here we're just talking in general, uh, and we're thinking of being able to easily substitute or do without. Okay. So that's the general concept of elasticity and it would relate to the prices so anyone have an yeah so um think about the situation of when you're buying a new car or when you need a replacement part if you need a replacement part there's usually some sense of urgency because your car broke down you need it for work so price changes you know so if the price went up 20 percent of a replacement part likely the quantity demanded isn't going to change all that much but if the price of a new car went up 20 percent well there's not the urgency there usually when you shop for a new car you know you can put off the decision until you find something just right so that that's the general idea here uh what about furnaces or air conditioners which one of these could you easily you know do without more easily furnace or air conditioner because once we know that then we know that that one is the most elastic could you do without a furnace in your home if you never had a furnace in your home then in the winter when it gets below zero the pipes would freeze and cause damage so you can't do without a furnace can you do without an air conditioner you can it won't maybe it won't be pleasant but you can do without so in terms of ranking them uh, furnaces would be more inelastic air conditioners would be more elastic of course this would be different maybe if we're talking about something living in florida uh what about winter hats or gloves which one can you easily do more easily do without yeah you can more easily do without gloves you can put your hands in your pockets but without a winter hat uh, that's going to be pretty tough okay so uh gloves would be easier to do without now we're just there's a relationship here between revenue and elite demand we have the demand curve for hot dogs earlier the revenue or the amount spent same thing would be obtained by multiplying the prices times the quantities okay so if the price was five dollars and 500 hot dogs were sold we would get that the total revenue would be 2500 five times 500 and then we could do that for every price okay so if we were to do that okay so we're gonna start with here being at this point here so at this point here the revenue to the firm would be five times 500 right now suppose that the uh, price of the hot dog falls from five to three dollars okay so that is a percent decrease in the price okay now at three dollars be able to sell 1500 and so the revenue here would be three times 1500 so let's think about whether this was a good idea for the firm to do so if it is charging a price of five dollars it will area here in revenue a plus b okay now if it charges three dollars instead it's going to lose a right it's not going to get this revenue anymore it already had this it's going to gain this amount okay because when the price went from three the quantity demanded increased a lot from 500 to 1500 okay so although they're losing some of this revenue because they aren't charging five dollars anymore they're gaining this amount in new sales so in when in the case where the demand is elastic you will get that lowering the price would increase your revenue because the buyers are, are very sensitive and so when you lower the price you get a lot more sales so in this case um, it would be beneficial to the firm they would gain in terms of total revenue okay but you know it depends on the demand curve and and where you are along the demand curve whether this will happen or not so there is a relationship between revenue and elasticity um, let's look at another example so if we have a demand curve like this we're going to do the same thing we start at a price so suppose the price is initially two dollars it's two dollars there's ten thousand in sales 
there's 10,000 quantity demanded, so 20,000 in sales. So this whole area here. Now, if the price increased to $3, it's going to happen. Well, the firm is going to lose some sales, right? If the price is $3 instead of 2 then they're going to lose out on this much sales because at a price of $3, only 8000 8, would be the quantity demanded. So they're going to lose out on this. Now they're selling each unit that they do sell at a higher price. So they're going to gain this area here, E. So in this case, the total revenue would increase because the area uh, E is larger than G. So the what we've done here is in the previous diagram, we had elastic. Uh, uh, we're part of the demand curve that's elastic. And we saw that lowering the price would increase revenue. Uh, but if we're on an el inelastic demand curve like here, then increasing the price could increase revenue. I'm just going to, uh, so this just gives you a, a summary. But what I want to show you is this example here. So this is giving you the details of what's going on for a particular demand curve. So if we draw any linear demand curve, and if we plot the revenue below, we're going to get something that looks like this. Okay, so this is the demand curve. It's linear. If we take all of the price and quantity combinate here and multiply them together to get revenue, we'll get this plot down here. So if the price is $10, we're not going to get any sales, so revenue is zero. If the price is $9, we're going to get one, so the revenue is $9. Okay, and then we just keep going and we plot this whole thing out. Okay, so if uh, the price is $1, we're going to sell 9 That would be this uh, revenue rate here. So you can see that where you are along the demand curve, um, deter you know, there's different revenues associated with where you are along a demand curve. Okay, so if you're charging a very high price like up here and you lower your price well you might be able to get you, you could get more revenue but if you're at a low price and you you know lower your price well then that might not happen so there's a relationship between the uh, points on the demand curve and revenue but there's also a relationship between uh, elasticity and this so look at an example so we are on the elastic so one thing i just wanted to point out uh, and i'll point it out in the previous previous diagram. So at the center of any linear demand curve, that corresponds to the highest revenue, okay? And it also happens that the center of the demand curve would be the unit elastic portion. So along any demand curve, an elastic portion and an inelastic portion. So this portion here would be the uh, elastic portion, okay? And this portion here would be the inelastic portion. And an easy way to determine where you are on the demand curve is to figure out if you could just think about increasing the price. If you can increase the price and increase your revenue, then you are on the inelastic portion. So here at a price of $1, we would have this revenue here. If we increased our price to $2, we would be here. So our revenue is increasing as we increase the price. But for points above the center, if we, for example, increased our price from seven to eight dollars at seven dollars we're roughly here at eight dollars roughly here you can see that revenue is falling okay so basically we're going to say that if we have elastic demand if we know that the price were to increase then the revenue would fall and then this is just the opposite case so if we're on the elastic portion and the price change falls, and the change in total revenue would be up demand. So if demand's inelastic, that means the firm can increase the price and be able to increase revenue, right? So if the price if they increase the price, then they will increase their revenue. And then the other way around. And then with unit elastic, it's just unchanged. Okay. So yeah, I mean you if you have a very steep demand curve compared to a very flat demand curve, then that means the uh elasticity will you know it's it does represent very sensitive buyers but on any demand curve whether it's steep or flat you can break down the demand curve into an elastic and an inelastic portion but a demand curve very steep you know throughout it's you know the percentage change in the quantity demanded will be much less for a given uh, change in price than the other demand curve but you can go along the demand curve so we are going to let me just look ahead here for a sec um so we are going to 
to talk about this at a moment in this problem, but we will at some point talk about calculating the price elasticity along the demand curve. So I think some of your questions will be a little more clear there. So it looks like we're getting uh, a bit uh, strapped for time. So what I'm going to do is just complete this active learning question, and then we'll continue the rest for tomorrow for the next class. So do this problem, and then hopefully it'll clear up some of your questions. So we're given some demand information in this table. So we just have different prices and the quantity demand. And it's saying to draw the demand curve, okay? And then it's asking us what the total revenue is at each price. And then we're going to break apart that demand curve into the different components, elastic or unit elastic, okay? So if we were to draw this demand curve, it would look like this. So it's a linear demand, curve, okay? So that's easy, that's fine, nothing confusing there. We're just plotting these points. Now, what is the total revenue at each price? Well, if we look at the price of 800, we know the quantity demand is 400. We multiply them together, we get total revenue. So let's do that for each of the four prices. And what we end up with is total revenue being uh, indicated as here. So we can clearly see that as we increase the price, at first the revenue increases, then it stays the same, and then it starts falling again. Okay, so what are the different areas on the demand curve associated with this and how can we find them? Well, if we can increase the price and our revenue increases, we're on the inelastic portion. So the inelastic portion then would be here, okay? So if we can, alternatively, if we decrease the price and we lose out on uh, revenue, then that's also the inelastic portion. So, um, well, let's go through each of these. So when the price drops from Eight, we'll, we'll start from 800 and go down. So if the price drops from 800 to 600, total revenue moves in the opposite direction from 32,000 to 4,800. And again, you can, so when demand is elastic, it means that the percentage change in the price is less than the percentage change in the quantity demanded. So here, just think we've decreased the price and we end up getting, and so if our quantity demand is really sensitive, you know, and we get a lot of a large increase in sales because of that, we can do better off, right? So if we decrease our price from 800 to 600, it happens to be that we get enough new sales because of that to increase our revenue, okay? So that's the elastic portion. If we have a price change and total revenue stays constant, then that we just say that that's the unit elastic portion. And, you know, we're looking at ranges here. So we're looking, you know, between this, it's unit elastic. So really, actually, it's the point in between, right in the middle of the demand curve. But we're sort of doing this over a range, right? If we, but if we cut points in here on each side, we would still be getting that to the middle. Um, but if we, you know, if we have little smaller and smaller ranges, everything would just be the same. But, you know, the uh, unit elastic portion is actually right in the middle. But don't worry too much about that. Just make sure you know the how to figure out the different areas. So when we go from six to 400, we find that the total revenue stays the same. So that's the unit elastic portion. And then if we drop the price from 400 to 200, um, we also fall, find that the revenue falls. So in this case, when we drop the price, because we're, we have inelastic demand and the percentage change in the quantity isn't as high as the percentage change in the price, then we're going to, we're losing out here. We are dropping the price, but the increase in sales isn't enough to boost our revenue. It actually will decrease it. So we're better off actually increasing the price here because we would get more revenue if you're thinking of respect. Okay, so the bottom line is any linear demand curve, whether it's really steep or really flat, we can break it apart into these three components. Um, the center of the demand curve will be where the maximum revenue is. If you were to think of plotting revenue below and points to the left of this will be a lot, points to the right will be any lost. Um, so I think we will we'll we'll, we'll stop here. Well, we'll finish this uh, slide here. So we're just going to talk briefly about the four determinants of price elasticity of demand. So all we're asking here is, you know, what's important? What causes demand to be elastic or not? Well, one thing is how big 
or how large of a portion of consumer's income does the price of the good represent? So, you know, if the price of bubble gum increases by 10%, the quantity demand is likely not going to change all that much. But if you're talking about buying a home and the price is 10% higher, that and that, that makes up a large, much larger proportion of your income, then you're going to be more sent. Um, so substitutes, of course. So we already talked about this a lot. So one of the key things is uh, ability to substitute or do without. Access to substitutes is very important. If there's no substitutes available, it's going to be less elastic, more inelastic. Um, and if we have it being a necessity versus a luxury, so this is the doing without uh, example or idea. So necessities, people are going to be less responsive to price changes than if something's a luxury and they can easily do without. And elasticity can change over time um, because, you know, habits can change, that sort of thing, habits and needs. Uh, also, over time, moods can, can evolve and that sort of thing. So, but the most important determinants are the first. So let's uh, end it there. And we'll continue uh, in the next class with the rest of this lecture. Sorry, there, I know I, I realize it's a lot of material, but this is uh, part of the CPA requirements, and this is the uh, material I need to cover. So I understand it's a lot, uh, but I'll do my best to try and it as clear as possible. And you do have lots of uh, practice questions and that sort of thing. So. Anyways, when we get closer to the midterm, I'll give you a lot of information on the midterm and try and direct you in your studying uh, attempts the best as I can. So yeah, we will continue with this chat. So we're gonna learn how to calculate elasticity along that demand curve. And I think some of your questions will be a little more clear. So I, I just wanna stress again too, it, the, the the structure of this course is so that you you do your pre-class quizzes. You, you know, you don't master the material, but but you, you, you get a good idea. Then we go through the lecture. We do some, we're doing problems in the lecture. Now, if you go back and read the chapter in the textbook and also look at slides, I think a lot of the misunderstandings will be clarified now. So, that, you know, it's a way to reinforce the, the learning and the material. So anyways, uh, uh, if, does anyone have any sort of any administrative questions or any quick questions that I can answer? Nothing else do uh, except for the for the next chapters. And yeah, I you should have access to the answers to the the quizzes not uh if if just double check maybe that they come up later if not just remind me at the beginning of next class and i'll i'll take a look and see how i can get those to you but you should be able to look in the if you go if you go into the connect platform and you look at i think it's your results for the quizzes it should give you some information in there yeah so let me let me know um, is it compulsory to attend lectures? Well, you guys are adults. Um, I'll let you make that decision. What's the smart thing to do? I mean, if you have to miss one or two over the term because of a, you know, a certain situation, then, you know, that's understandable. But, you know, you should be trying to attend the lectures the best you can. I, I, I do record, I, I may not always, you know, be able to record them. Uh, well, I may forget or there might be an issue, technical issue or something like that. So it's possible that it may not get recorded. I am attempting, you know, trying to make sure I record every one and posting them after, but there could be situations where uh, I'm not able to do the recording. So then that wouldn't be a good thing. So I think you should just attend the lectures. It's only, you know, two hours a week. Uh, it's not that much. And you don't have to drive to school. You, you know, there's lots of uh, time saving things associated with uh, doing this remotely. But of course, it is much better to be in a classroom. It's a little easier to answer all the questions. But um, yeah, we got to make best with what we have. So anyways, uh, yeah, so that's, that's it for today. We will see you next class. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always send me an email. Other than that, have a, have a great day.